Mr. Dalvin. Yes, from sir. One of the greatest R&B groups of all time. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Undoubtedly in everyone's top lists. Yes. Jodeci, what is good? That's a blessing, man. Just here. Grinding, man. You know, doing what we do. Oh, man. I'm, I'm such a big Jodeci fan, and I'm not even an R&B fan like that. Right. It seems well, like Jodeci's Jodeci... Jodeci's big R&B. That's, yeah. It, it's know, one of those <laughs> groups that the fellas could listen to right. and still and right. still feel like men, you know, right. when yeah. they listen we, to We're more it. than R&B. It's, you know, we, we purposely set out to, to make it like that, you know, so it'd be cool for guys to listen to it like, nah, we ain't just some soft niggas just around here just singing oh, love yeah. songs. So, you know, it's more than that. Yeah, man. So, let's start from the beginning. You guys are all from North Carolina. Yeah. Well, me and Devontae actually were born in Hampton, Virginia. Oh, okay. And we moved to North Carolina at a really, really young age, so we basically from North Carolina. Right. And you and Devontae are brothers. Mm-hmm. Casey and JoJo are brothers. Absolutely. You guys formed into a group, mm-hmm. and then you guys decided one day to just go to New York. Uh, yeah, with a little more detail than that, but that's pretty much the nuts and bolts of it, yeah. Okay. And what happened the first day you guys got to New York? Uh, we got a deal. Uh, we... we uh, uh, crazy thing is, we didn't even know we had never been to New York. None of us had never been to New York, and we looked in the yellow pages and found Uptown MCA because uh, all our favorite artists at the time were on MCA in Uptown, which was you know you had no additional MCA, Bobby Brown, uh, you know you had BBD, then you had uh, on Uptown it was Guy, which was on MCA as well, Heavy mm-hmm. D, you know, and so on and so on. So you guys walked into the record label. Well, you guys hustled into the record hustled, label. Hustled, yeah, hustled. Because <laughs> you guys showed up and they wouldn't let you in. They wouldn't let us in because it was, it was closed. It was after hours. It took us all day trying to find it in New York. And we couldn't. We had no idea what was going. You know, we finally found it and it was after hours. So, you know, they was like, well, you don't have an appointment. We can't see you. Plus, nobody's here to listen to you guys anyway. Come okay. Back, basically. So then you guys got in, though. We got in. After much persuasion, we got in. Okay. Got in. And then you guys met with an A&R, I guess. Yeah, met with a He fell asleep on our demo tapes. <laughs> Told us to go back to North Carolina. We wasn't ready. So how did you guys get past that? Um, uh, well, we, we was, you know, we begged and pleaded that he listened to a couple more songs. And he's like, well, he kept falling asleep. And I'm, I'm thinking he was, he was ready to go home. And uh, we just started singing. Uh, I want to say Come and Talk to Me. He started singing a cappella. And uh, Heavy D's dancer, was, his name was... Um, uh, it wasn't Trouble Tr- T. Oh, Trouble T. Roy, he was passed away. Uh, yeah. It was... Um, G Wiz, okay, the other dancer, and uh, he knocked on the door, and uh, he was like, "Was it you guys?" He was like, "Yeah." He said, "Hold on for a second. He went and got Heavy D, and we sung for Heavy. Heavy went and got Andre Harrell, and Andre came in, and he made us sing a couple more songs, and he said, "Grab your coats," and he took us to dinner, and that was it. And you know, history was made after that. And you guys signed the deal right then and there. We signed an interim deal, meaning that we wasn't going to talk to nobody else and interested, and he wanted to bring us right back to New York. So he sent us to North Carolina and brought us back. Okay. And how close were you guys as a group by that point in terms of musically and friendship-wise? Uh, we were brothers. I mean, inseparable. You know, brothers. I mean, yeah. it, it, you couldn't break the chain. It was, it was That's all it was. It was us. That's all we had. You know, he took us from North Carolina. Even in North Carolina starting, we were always together. You know, music, 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 day in, music, day out. And uh, we got to New York. That's, we didn't know anybody, so we had no choice but to, to, to build a better bond. They yeah. stuck us in the projects in the hood and the Bronx. <laughs> And so, oh, that's where he stuck y'all? Yeah, Rose Avenue, you know? Okay. So. Because I heard originally when you met uh, Casey, he pulled a gun out on you? He did. He did. That was the original meeting. Uh, a girl group, actually, a gospel girl group called Unity. You know, they was like, you know, because we had heard about each other in North Carolina because they did the gospel circuit, but they were more like a quartet. You know, me and my brother more like a uh, contemporary gospel and it's like, you know, y'all got some meat. Y'all can do something amazing together. And, you know, they always heard of the, the, uh, the Great Brothers. We heard of the uh, Haley Brothers. And, uh, you know, they was like, you know, y'all should do something. Y'all should do something. So one night we said, okay, take us to meet them. And uh, we went to this the, the studio they had or whatever, whatever it was. And Casey thought I was talking to one of his, uh, his little girlfriends because she was in the group. And at the time he pulled a pistol out on me. So, yeah. And you actually became cool after that? Well, not exactly. No, no not exactly. right after that. No, uh, well, Devontae actually stayed. Me and Casey got into a little altercation in the hallway, blah, blah, blah. And Devontae and Jojo went off to a room and started working on music. And so, therefore, Jodeci was born right then, but it was Devontae and Jojo. It wasn't me and Casey. Casey went back to Merlin. He was working on some other stuff and with his gospel group. And I went my separate ways, you know. And after one, my brother was like, you know, man, they really cool, man. Come on down. And I was like, man, nah, you know, he pulled a gun out of me. Man, come on, man, really. I mean, did you think he was going to shoot you? I was going to shoot him. 
Because my cousin had a gun, too. So, it's like, in case he got found out later, his gun didn't even work. It was like a little rinky dink 22. But, you know, it was going to just be all bad. But, you know, God works in mysterious ways. So, it didn't happen like that. Then, then you know, me and Casey became best friends in the group after that. You know, not long after that, but we became yeah. best friends, yeah. Okay. So, you guys get signed. You're in the Bronx. You start working on your first album. Right. Forever My Lady. How many of those songs were already done before you guys got signed? Basically, the whole thing. Oh, so you guys were done. You get a couple like the B sides, like "Gotta Love" wasn't done. It was just the idea, and okay. a couple other songs. But the, the main, the main meat of the album was done. There were songs that you know written in North Carolina, and you know ideas. They weren't perfected like they were, but they were basically done. Right, and it, it sounded like it was like gospel, but it was R and B, and it was hip hop, and it was kind of like this weird melding that you never really heard before. Because at the time, New Jack Swing and all right. that really poppy, you know, dancey type stuff came out and you guys came out like rah, like on some other shit. Well, you know, it, what it was was, um, Jodeci was a self-contained group and I think at the time it, we were so young, you know, I was 15 when I first got to New York, you know, and uh, we were so young and the sound was so big and it was just, it was more than just R&B because we would listen to, you know, we listened to Def Leppard, Van Halen, we listened to you know, as well as Prince, Michael Jackson, Luther Vandross, we listened to everybody, Donny Hathaway and all the old Oh, great, that we listened to, we just incorporated everything, as well as gospel. We listened to the Winans, Commission at the time, and we just put it in a melting pot and stirred it up, and you got what you got out of it. As, right. well, as, well, as well as Teddy Riley, we, you know, towards yeah. the New Jack Swing, because that era was big at the time, and that was a big influence on a lot of our, a lot of our music and stuff, too. But you know, as far as like the harmonies, you know, people were doing like four-part harmonies as well. Mm -hmm. We were doing six and seven and eight. So right, it sounded really big. Yeah, it was really big. So yeah. we would find notes, and that was our thing, Jodeci sound. It was like, what's the Jodeci sound? It was, we would find notes that wasn't statistically, I mean, you know, that, that would go into a harmony. And so we made it work. Yeah. And, you know, you and Devontae were handling the production. Right. And Casey and JoJo were doing the vocals. Well, not all of us. We all did vocals. Well, but but vocals. Casey was the lead right. vocalist. Right. And that was just a talent you guys found that was just out of this world. Right. So... How involved was Puffy in the early process on that first album? Uh, he was a he was a big visionary, you know. Puffy's got a big vision, you know. That's why he's so successful today. And people are like, you know, Puffy's not talented, but he really is. You know, that's a talent in itself. And as far as the way we saw it, he he saw what we saw. But it's hard for us to convey that to to Andre Harrell in Uptown because R and B was the, the suits, the sequence suits, and the the routines and the choreography, and that wasn't us. And we, you know, we had our own way. We wanted to be street. We wanted to be, you know, like like the, like the homeboys on the corner. So to make people want to listen to us, like not be just cool and, and just stiff. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he he translated that to Andre and to Uptown. Like you know, I see where they're going, and he kind of we kind of put on his shoulders and risked everything from him being an intern to actually working into Uptown because he believed in what we believed in. Okay, so when you guys first came out. I thought the first single was Forever My Lady because that's when I was first introduced to, right. to Jodeci. But I guess there was something else first. Well, we did, actually, yeah. We did Gotta Love, which the record company hated it. And, <laughs> and, and, but, you know, it, it, it was cool because it wasn't a ballad and we wasn't known for up-tempos. And we wanted to set the tone for what Jodeci was. And we wasn't really looking at ourselves like a ballad group. Like you said, we're more like a rock, hip-hop, just like just, just grungy, everything, anything goes type of group that did beautiful music. And uh, so... Andre told Puffy, if this don't work, you're going to lose your job. And his job was right on if Gotta Love, the single, hit or not. And it didn't and, hit. No, it didn't hit. <laughs> <laughs> it, didn't, it missed big time. But but what was what was important about that single that it set the tone, what Jodeci was coming with, whether it be a slow song or not, then Found My Lady came shortly after. And, you know, it, we all know the success of how Found My Lady and so forth and so on. Right, because I feel like from Forever My Lady, you guys were, were out of here. Right. Like... You, it was just like hit after hit after hit after right. hit, and Jodeci was just always around. Right. Because, I mean, you guys ended up having Forever My Lady, Get On Up. Stay. Stay. Come and talk to me. Come and talk to me. Freaking you. Freaking you. And my favorite song, Feenin. Okay. That, that was my personal yeah. favorite. You know? Because it's just that, because you guys like... The whole begging for pussy thing. <laughs> you guys were the best at right. it ever. Well, actually, you know, hold on, hold on. We only begged one, one song. That was Keith Sweat did the begging. We only begged and cry for you. But, Feenin. 
If it, it wasn't just, you know, Take my money, my house, and my car. That's called game. For one hit of you, that's you can have it all. Game. You were tricking off everything that, you that's want. Called, that's called game. <laughs> but, you know, but, <laughs> hey, but see, but hold on. The thing is about that, it was giving guys that didn't really have game the mouthpiece of what to say. Okay. You know what I'm saying? I, we, just, we just, hey, look, here's, here's the blueprints. You trying, to, you trying to get laid, here you hear the lyrics right here. That's basically what we was doing. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Well, anyways, that, that's how I saw it. <laughs> I, I thought it was incredible. Thank you. And, and each album went how many times platinum? Uh, three, four. Uh, I'm not sure on oh, the numbers now. Now they, I mean, it's just a resurgence of Jodeci all of a sudden a couple years ago. So I don't know. Now, when you look at the way Jodeci is put together, you got Casey and JoJo. They're sort of like the the, the lead vocals, right? Right. Devante is the producer, and. You know, he's kind of touted as the produ- as like the producer of the group, but you're also the producer of the group, mm-hmm. right? Explain the the symmetry and how you guys all work together to create music. Um, well, it's like, you know, we 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 as far as a songwriter and a producer, I if I have an idea, and just being a, sometimes just being a singer, you don't hear what I hear on the song. So sometimes before Casey and Joe go in the studio, I have to have to lay down the lead the lead the reference vocal and have okay, this is how you sing it. You know, that's why you hear Casey and Jodo sound totally different from Jodeci because they don't have they don't have men divided as far as the direction. Yeah. You know, we have the vision and we have the direction to go in, and that's, and that's big when you deal with vocalists sometimes. They don't they don't they don't really produce, so they don't hear what you hear. You know, it's hard to just just give them a microphone and say, okay, sing this song, sing Phoenix, or sing freaking your sing, come and talk to me. Sometimes they have to be guided and led. You know, I work with Mariah Carey, same thing. You got sometimes you have to guide people and lay down. The, this is this is how you say. It. Now whatever magic you put on top of it, however you season it, that's on you. But this is this is where you stay. This is your boundaries. Playing right here. So it's, that's just how it worked. You know, everybody had a role to play. You know, nobody tried to do things that that wasn't. You know, his thing over there, his thing over there. Let's stay in our lanes and let's just do what we do. And you did the backup vocals as well. Oh yeah, we all did backup. Okay, vocals. so you guys all harmonized together right. and, and created that that Jodeci sound. Mm-hmm. Incredible. Incredible. Now, at one point, people thought that you broke up, but you never really broke up because Casey and JoJo started doing their own projects. Right. So, what happened with the group exactly? Um, I think I, I think we got to a point to where, you know, when you bring a, a when you have some type some type of success, you always get outsiders that come in, and so the inner circle gets the it spreads thinner and thinner and thinner. So, I think that people had different directions for you know even Casey and JoJo, and they wanted a direction that. That wasn't a Jodeci direction. It was more of Casey and Joda, more kind of like an adult direction. Whereas Jodeci is grimy and gritty and and you know just hardcore over here. They were kind of more a little more polished, and that was just they sound that they created for themselves. Okay. And you know we all kind of went, but we never broke up. You know I supported them and they, that's y'all sound, that's y'all thing. And you know I congratulate them on the success they had with All My Life and you know the other songs they had. But right, All My Life was a monster. Right. Yeah. How come you stopped seeing Jodeci group albums though? We start recording together. Okay. You know, they, they don't mean if we broke up, we just start putting out songs. But as far as good, we still, you know, we still hung out. We still saw each other. Sometimes if they're in the town, they got a show. You know, we all hung out. But as far as recording, they, you know, they was busy touring. And Devontae was busy doing his thing. I was busy doing my thing. So. At what point did Suge Knight start coming around? Uh, so we met Suge, I want to say, around the Billboard Awards. I want to say that. Around the Billboard Awards in 19, yeah, it had to be about 94, 95. So Shook came around, and then when did you start getting really affiliated with Shook and Death um, Row? Shook came around, and he 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 talked to us about the business a lot. Okay. And uh, although we had sold a, a gang of albums, there was no signs that we were any that we were more successful than we sold a hundred. You know, so, me, so you guys were all broke. Basically, I mean, you know, we went through the thing that artists go through. You just unaware right. of what's going on. We're well, just happy to be in, in, in public and selling millions of records and just right. having fun. Well, and I assume that when you guys stepped into that office for the first time and signed a record deal that same day, essentially, it was not the best record deal. No. Oh, no. It's yeah. terrible. It probably wasn't the worst. I mean, but, you know, if there's, there's, no, there's no manual to set you up for anything. Yeah. You're just happy to be there and you're ha- just happy to, to, okay, well, I don't know what's going to happen. You, don't, you never could... Right. Imagine the kind of success that we had coming. We right. were just guys doing what we love to do. And you guys were just teenagers. Yeah, we were teenagers. And okay. we were teenagers. So then what does Shook do? Um, Shook came in at a time and he, he explained to us what the business was about. You know, he never asked us for anything. 
You know, he never, he just like, you know, I like you guys. And, you know, Snoop was, they were fans of Jodeci and we were fans of Snoop and Dre. And, and, and he made the connection between us and Death Row. And, you know, he started educating us on the business. You know, who go around snooping them? They got 10, 12 cars and jewelry. And we just, you know, we just like, oh, you know, at the time we were just neck and neck in record sales. And we're looking at them, how they living, how we living. And it wasn't adding up. Yeah. So we started asking questions, you know, and nobody was giving us straight answers. And, and it was just, okay, well, listen, well, let me help you guys. Okay. And that's just how the whole Death Row, Suge Knight, Jodeci relationship started. Right. And Suge has a reputation of, quote, unquote, helping people out of their bad record deal situations. In fact, that's how we started with the Vanilla Ice yeah, situation and then with the Dr. Dre and Easy situation. Right. So now you have Suge helping you out of your record situation. Right. Do you think he strong-armed his way into a better deal for you guys? It all depends on what you call strong arm. I mean, it's like if if if, if somebody takes something from your little brother and you want to get it back, he want to get it back, and they wouldn't give it back, what would you do? I mean, how would you get it back? Well... You wouldn't write him a love letter. I mean, it's like... Right, well, you either do it legally or you, you know, do it with, with force. Right. I mean, I just think that he, he, was, he was wise enough to know how far to go, and he was educated enough to know how to sit down and talk. You know, I've witnessed both sides of him being angry and him being, you know, a politician. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've never, I've never witnessed the, the him result the violence on our behalf. Now, you know, I've heard stories and stuff, but on our behalf, I've never seen him result the violence. I've seen him sit down and have an educated conversation with lawyers and record companies. Okay. You no, know, maybe a little heated at times, but they were, you know, they came across as as how they're supposed to. Okay, because I remember the first time that I heard Jodeci affiliated with Death Row was Devante did a song on Tupac's All Eyes on Me. Right. Was that the beginning, or were you guys already messing with each other at that point? We, all, we did the first song we did with them was uh, uh, Murder's the Case. Aha. Uh -huh. We did Come Up to My Room with the Dog Pound. Right, that was okay. The first, that was the first record that we did with them. Okay. Then uh, uh, we just started doing like production stuff around with certain artists at the studio. Right. And then, uh, then you know, Pac came around after that, later, later on after that. Okay, right. And then uh, Casey and JoJo did Toss It Up. Toss it up, yeah. One, one of Pac's best songs. Mm -hmm. um, so how well did you know Tupac and how much work did you guys do together? Uh, I got to know him very well. We had a couple of in-depth conversations. I mean, I got to know him very well. You know, because okay. uh, he bought, um, how do you want it? He bought, the, he bought the idea to me first. And he was like, you know, I, I, I want to put Jodeci on this record. Because he was singing the hook, actually, at first. Oh, Tupac did Tupac, the toss he, it up he, hook? No, he was, how do you want it? Oh, how do you want it? How do you want it? He was saying that deep baritone, how do you want it? How do you? And he said, I don't like my voice in that. I was like, it sounds good because it sounded really eerie. Huh. And it was a whole different vibe, but it sounded eerie. He said, man, I just want y'all to do something to it. So that's when I called, I called uh, K and Joe. I was like, you know, hey, man, you know, Tupac want to do this record. And, uh, you know, so we got to the studio. And if you listen to the record real close, I kept his voice in there. He told me to take it out, but his voice is the bottom voice in there. Oh, that, so Tupac is actually underlying you know, on, on the, the chorus. Yeah, and how do you oh, want it? Yeah. So, that's so crazy. And I mixed him in with the harmony, but it worked. Because, I mean, I knew it, I knew the vision he was going with the song, and he just, you know, we put the harmony over there and made it sound big. And he, the verse he had originally, he went back and did it over. He said, oh, y'all crush me on that. I'm going to do my verses. <laughs> but, I mean, I wish, like, I told somebody to release all the verses that he didn't put out. Because he would go back and if... If if he felt like you outside on the song, he would go back and rewrite his verse. But yeah, his verses were so dope on like all the material he had. But he would go back and rewrite it real quick. So, right. Yeah. I mean, I've talked to various people about Tupac's work ethic, and they said that he had this feeling that he needed to hurry up and get as much music out as possible because he didn't think he was going to be around for that long. He would write like that, like that. I mean, verses would just come like that. So you I saw wouldn't that for myself, yeah. So you were there producing with him and he's just... He's like that. I mean, yeah, and I heard like he would that. get mad at producers that weren't quick enough. I, he would get... He would get. I saw him get aggravated when it were things that he didn't know about, like the production side of it. Mm -hmm. Like if he didn't understand something in the studio and, and he saw that you were a little frustrated because someone near a piece of equipment, he would get angry. But he, he was just really passionate about what he did. Okay, yeah. and you guys have more songs I heard that you guys did together that never came out? No, I didn't do any more. I just worked on uh, How Do You Want It with him and just other stuff around Death Row, but just Tupac is the only one I really worked hand-in-hand -hand with. Okay. You know, you guys had an interesting situation because you guys came up with Puffy. Right. And then now you guys are rolling with Death Row and the East Coast, West Coast beef breaks out. Right. And you guys are cool with both sides. Right. So what happened with you guys in the middle of all this? Well, 
I mean, Puff got upset. He, I mean, when the, the whole thing that people really know, it's really stupid why this whole thing happened, which I'm not going to get into, but it's really stupid. The whole thing was really stupid. could have been avoided. And at the time it was brewing, you know, I, I was like, man, come on, this is, this is really retarded. And it, it started pulling people in. At first it was two individuals, and it was over something really stupid. Sugar and Puffy. Well, it, you know, it was two people, but it was really—it could have been avoided. It, was, it started off as a, a joke, and then it just got escalated. It got escalated, and uh, you know, I remember, and I was, and I was cool with Sugar and Puff. You know, I, right. I, that's why I didn't wanted to see it like that because it didn't have to be like that. And uh, when one Puff called me, he's like, "Man, what side do you are?" I said, "Man, I'm from the South. Puff. I ain't gonna do with that." <laughs> you know, I'm saying I'm from the South. I'm not from the. I'm from the South. So it's like you know, I'm not thinking he thought that I betrayed him, but I didn't. You know, for me, I didn't have anything to do with none of it. None of it. I wasn't riding with sugar. I wasn't riding with that. It was just both of y'all, my friends, and it's like I don't have any problems with anybody. And that's that's the position that Jodeci took as a group, because we was cool with sugar and, and was cool with you know with Puff and Big and everybody. So right. Well, I mean, I guess Jodeci sort of showing up. Wait. Well, no, I guess that was a that wasn't a Biggie diss. I guess you know, the source of what. Well, yeah, you guys were at the Source Awards. Yeah, we presented Biggie with the with the award, though. You guys presented yeah. Biggie with the award. Were you on stage with Suge when he said? No, with, yo, we wasn't on stage with Suge. We wasn't on stage, and I was like, when he said, that, I was like, oh man. Right. Oh, but so you sat there and he said, "If y'all get tired, motherfuckers, yeah, all in your videos. Your videos, come to death row, come to death row." Yeah. yeah and then like, everyone booed. Uh, man, it was like, oh man. And then and then Snoop came on, came and said, you know, y'all don't got love for yeah, Snoop Dogg. Yeah, got love for the West. And then yeah. the booing kept going. And it, and it, yeah, and that was it. I mean, we left, and it was just chaos. And I was like, man, this is about to get ugly. Because it could have been avoided. It could have really been avoided. And it was like one of those situations, like, why? But then you think, like, later in the years, it was like maybe it was inevitable for this to happen. You think, like, well, yeah, why did things like this happen? So, you know. Were you cool with Biggie? Oh, yeah. I knew Biggie before Biggie had his, before he put his first song out. Right, because Biggie was kind of, he was doing songs with Heavy D. Yeah, and Biggie yeah. had a, had a, a song out that called "Party and Bullshit." Right, people don't know about. It, they don't remember that song. But, no, I remember it. And he and, and he bullshit, yeah, and yeah, party. Yeah, and uh, and after that, I guess it didn't take off like he thought. And he was gonna be signed to Uptown, and he didn't. Something happened, and you know, Puff lost his, lost his deal with Uptown, and put. Well, he Puff was started to get into it with Andre Harrell. Yeah, well, you know, and then he he lost his deal. He got fired from Uptown, and, yeah. and I guess he took Biggie, and he was in the Biggie was in a holding pattern. Yeah, it was a while before Puff got the deal up. But Clive Davis and Arista. And Arista, yeah. And he was in the holding pad, and I think he got a little disgruntled. But, you know, the rest is history. He came out, and he did what he's going to do. I mean, when you look at the, the whole East Coast, West Coast beef and the tragedy behind it and how you guys were in the mix, not taking sides, but in the mix, being pulled from all directions, how do you feel about it? Like I said, I think it was, it was, it was for nothing. We lost two great, talented people, two of the most talented people, uh, rappers we probably ever see in our lifetime. You know, for nothing. And I think it was senseless. And, you know, um, it could have been avoided. But, you know, and, and, and like I said, I was cool with Pac. I was cool with Biggie. You know, and, and I think that at the end of the day, I think that uh, they thought we chose a side to... to but it was, it was never that. Yeah. It was never that. And then when Puffy was really working with you guys initially to sort of mold the overlook and everything, I guess he was called Puffy because he would start to puff and lose his shit. You know, I never knew why they called him Puffy. That's that, that's the name. That, that's what I really? heard. Like, they called him Puffy because right. he, he would get all puffy. Like, he would huff and puff when he wouldn't get his way, and they started nicknaming him I never puffy. knew that. That's, you never knew I'm that? I something new every time. You never seen Puffy bug out? I seen him bug out, but I seen him. I just I, I call him more passion than bugging out because yeah. he, he just liked what he liked, you know? And a lot of times he was right. You know, we were arguing him just to make him mad sometimes. He was like, oh, come on, huh? Come on, man. But he would never just go and lose it. There was a rumor that, that TLC's creep was about you. I heard that too. Is that true? I actually asked her about that. She said no, but somebody said she said it was. Like, who knows? Okay. Yeah. Well, what are some of the craziest moments in your heyday? Because you guys were one of the biggest groups in the world. Yeah. And between the concerts and the tours and, and the record sales and everything else like that, what are some of the biggest things that stood out to you? Um, I think... I think for for everybody that's, as an artist that's had some sort of success, you know, remotely close to Jodeci or, or anything, going to another country and have people that they can say your name in English and don't even know how to speak English or recognize you and know your words, sing your songs word for word, but can't speak a lick of English. I think that in itself is somewhat surreal, you know, just strangers all across the corners of the earth and know who you are. 
How was it like when Casey started dating uh, Mary J. Blige? For him or me? <laughs> I really didn't care. What about for the group? <laughs> I mean, it was it was it was drama for him. You know, I, I don't think it affected. I don't think it affected his performances any. I mean, his personal life probably got whatever it went through. But as far as Casey's always ready to go. He's 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 trained to go. As soon as he gets the microphone, in, he goes. So whatever affects him personally, I think he got a. I think he got a lot of bad bad raps about things that happen. Right. I mean, a lot of one side. You know, I respect him for not really responding to it because. A lot of things I know personally really didn't happen that I heard him getting accused of. So here's a story that I heard. Be Legit said the story during a, a class that we were, we were uh, hosting in, in, at Berkeley. One day, Be Legit was rolling around with Tupac. And he was rolling down, I guess, like L.A. or something. And he seen KC and Mary J. Blige arguing on the street. And he pulled over and got in the middle of the argument and told Casey that he shouldn't bother with Mary J. Blige because him and Mary J. Blige used to mess with each other and this ain't the type of woman they should be messing with. You ask me, is that true? This, this is a story that I heard. <laughs> oh, I don't know. That's a new one to me. That's, that's new. But there was a lot of drama between, between Casey and Mary J. Blige. There, yeah, there was a lot of drama. A lot of drama. I mean, but, you know, it is what it is. They were both young, successful, and in the public eye, and, and, you know, it is what it is, man. There was a, a situation where Devontae got robbed at gunpoint right. in his home. Mm -hmm. How bad was that situation? It was, at first, it happened on my birthday. Okay. And uh, we didn't know anything about it. We, they threw him a surprise birthday party. He was working on Let's Be Alone, the, the, one of the songs on the Diary of a Mad Band album. And... Uh, we was waiting on Devontae, waiting and waiting. It started getting late. And everybody in the studio waiting on Devontae. We kept calling him, calling him, calling him. And it was like, something ain't right, man. He just wouldn't not show up or or come to the studio or something. So, you know, our manager called studio. was like, now when everybody gets to Devontae's house, you know, somebody just broke in. But we didn't even know the severity of the situation. And, you know, they broke in his house, tried to kill him. Oh, they tried to kill him? Well, I mean, they split his skull open. Oh, so they, they pistol whipped him? Yep. Yeah. Tied him up, man. He was fighting back. He bit one of the guys' fingers off, and wait, he bit one of the guys' fingers yeah, off. Yeah, I mean, it, it was bad. So, and uh, you know, that was that. Do they know who was behind the attack? A lot of speculation. There's a lot of speculation over the years, and the guy that did, uh, they thought did it. Uh, they, it was two cousins. One of them killed each other. So one is in prison to the day. So, oh, okay. And, and what time was this in the, in the Jodeci story? Was this? This is the second album. We was working on our second album. Okay. Driving Mad Band. Were you guys with, with Death Row at this point or no? We was never with Death Row. Well, I mean, when you were rolling with Death Row. Or, um, no. No, this is before Death Row. Before okay. Death Row days. You guys sold how many tens of millions of albums? Nah, I couldn't tell you. I but millions know. and millions of albums. Right. Number one hits. And you have how many Grammys? None. Why is that? We've never been invited to the Grammys. Why is that? Well, I think that... I think that, like I was telling her, I was uh, having a discussion. I was like, you know, at the time, we, we were too black for the Grammys, considered too black. Okay. You know, we were too black for the Grammys. And, and it was crazy because you had people in our category that hadn't even scratched the surface of selling as, as many, near as many albums as us, or as popular as Jodeci. But, you know, at the time, we were considered too black. And I guess it was a risk for the Grammys, you know? Were you nominated? Never. Never even nominated? Never even nominated. That don't make no damn sense. Yeah, never nominated. Everything else but Grammys. Okay. Yeah. And, and so you guys feel like you were blacklisted in a way? Well, at the time, I mean, it, you know, it really didn't matter. It really didn't matter because what mattered to us was more than Grammys. I mean, the accolades are nice at the time, but, you know, it's a good thing to have. But our, to us, our fans meant more. And I felt like we didn't sell out and we didn't cross over. And the Grammys didn't want to come to us because of who we were. We wasn't going to change for the Grammys. If you don't, if you think we're too black and you're scared to have us on your program, then so be it. Right, but then fast forward to 2016, you have Kendrick Lamar yeah, that's what I'm saying. doing an African tribal dance with a, with a like on top of a police car yeah. and all this other type exactly. of shit in the Grammys. But you know, I think that I think that to me, I think Jodeci opened a, a lot of doors. We did we ground the pound for a lot of artists today. Yeah, even to to dress the way they do, to talk the way they do it, and look the way they do. And you know, we went through the the you know the, the getting shunned by awards and TV shows just because of the way we were and we and what we still for and we was yeah. too raunchy, too nasty. But now it's it's, it's cool. You, you it's almost mandatory. You say bitch and hoe in your song. And, <laughs> and I mean, like you know, right? And we look so at it's like almost the... mandatory. But it is what it is. 
I mean, so. like when you look at like the Bryson Tillers of the world right. and the Trap Soul and stuff like that, that to me is the Jodeci blueprint. Right. You know, they're calling it something else, but it's really what y'all were doing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And then you guys, you and your brother went on to find Timberland. Yeah, Missy. Missy. I, I, discovered, I, discovered, I discovered Missy and she brought Timberland along and, you know, along, along with Magoo and the rest of the whole slew of them people. Yeah, the whole VA. Yeah. I mean, did you guys have any idea what you had on your hands back then? I did. When I first met Missy, I knew, I didn't know exactly what it was, but I knew it was something. I knew, I said, you know, and she didn't look the part, like I said, uh, all the time. She wasn't the... But she was part of, part of a group, right? She was a part of a group, but her, I saw the, I saw the light on her. I just I just knew it was something special about her because, like I said, she wasn't the typical looking R&B chick with the you know, light skin, with the long hair. With the, She was totally different from that. Yeah, she was heavy set. Yeah, she was heavy set. And, uh, uh, you know, she just looked, she wasn't what you would like, oh, she's a sex symbol. Right, because her first song, she was running like a garbage bag. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like a filled up yeah, garbage, garbage bag, bag looking yeah. crazy, but it worked. It worked. For what yeah. she was super doing. Super duper fly. Super duper, uh, yeah, super duper fly. When you saw that, were you like, I? Right. I know, I know it was her. She was yeah. always creative like that. You know, she was always creative like that. And, and, and whatever she did, I wasn't, I wasn't surprised, you know. I feel you. Now, there was, there was talk about drug problems and, and so forth in the group. Right. Is any of that true? I mean, you look at it like this, man. I think every every artist, every rock and roll group has some kind of problems, some kind of some kind of vice, some kind of ailment, whatever it is you want to call it. And you know, Jodeci is no different. You know, and uh, we don't glorify drug use or whatever it is, but everybody has their issues. So whatever it is, you know, hopefully people deal with them the way they deal with them. Right. I mean, there was one video I think in Australia with Casey and JoJo. I think we're performing. And he fell out on the stage. Yeah, they just literally just fell off. Right. I mean, he said he was tired. The only thing I can do is just go with what he says. He yeah. said he was tired. He flew uh, 18 hours and he got off a plane and he said he wasn't drunk or high, whatever he was. He said he was tired. And I wasn't there, so I can't say, oh, yes, he was. Okay. Now, where, how it looked is, is probably. It looked a little know, crazy. It looked crazy. I mean, was there ever a point where there was like an intervention or rehab or anything else like that? Oh, well, I mean, like I say, if you look if you look at history, man, everybody that. that, that has any kind of issues like me like you know if i have issues i'm gonna deal with them the way i deal with them best you know and if if, if people want to get help and they seek help they deal with the way they deal with them you know i think everybody that that's healthy today has went to rehab in some sort you know which is a good thing if you you know if you're that bold enough to go get help then you should yeah you know, that's what it is i mean when you look at the impact that jodeci has made even to this day like for example when Kanye announced Kim's pregnancy, they played Forever My Lady. You know, I don't know how many weddings Forever My Lady has played at right. <laughs> since you guys did it. We just sang it for, uh, for uh, DJ Khaled and uh, for Dear Mama last week, or well, two weeks ago. Right. For Mother's Day. When you look back on it, what was really the impact you feel Jodeci made on music? Um, well, I think we, we came from an era where we were really talking about something. You know, but lyrical content was more than just, oh, I like that beat. You know, when you hear somebody now, I like that beat. They don't even say, I like that song anymore. So I like that beat. They don't even know what the lyrics are. You know, and we were talking about something, so people felt they could relate in any in some sort of way. Whether it made you think about your ex-girlfriend, made you want to fall in love, made you want to have sex, made you want to do anything, made you want to dance. I mean, we kind of toggled your emotions, and that's what was important at the time when I think we were writing the songs we wrote and, you know, doing the songs we did. I mean, when you were making these songs like Forever My Lady and Freaking You, did you know how big they were going to impact? I don't think a great writer song or write songs is just wonder how big they're going to be. I think you write from the way you feel at the moment. Yeah. And I think that being that the songs, like, like, people can identify with them, that's what makes songs hit because you can identify what somebody's saying, you know, at the time. I think when you go out there and oh, I got to make a big song, bigger than Forever My Lady, then that's when you lose it. You just write what it is at the moment. Yeah. You know? I mean, in terms of the, the process, what do you think you're most proud of in terms of what you put together? Myself personally? Yeah. Um, me, myself personally, I think that I got people to believe because I was, I was really, really, uh, uh, I spearheaded the campaign of how we look visually mm -hmm. as well as a lot of the sound that, that matched. And I think that to get them to understand because they didn't really see all the time without how I saw us. Cause I was always, it was always important how we look, 
because it, it made a statement to me every time we we on award shows, concerts, and how our shows came across. You know, because I put together our tours and everything had that was visual for me. And I think that for me, outside of Devontae being the you know the, the head guy in charge of all most of the music and I'm being right in front of him, right. I wanted to take on the role of how that we came across as our perception. Yeah, and you know. And, and, and we set the bar for everybody else, not only to, to, to sound like jealousy, but to look like jealousy. And that's still to this day, that's almost standard. You know what I'm right. saying? Right, because when you look at how Devontae looked back then, shirt off, covered in tattoos, right. that was weird back then. Right, right. You fast forward to 2017, it's weird if you don't have tattoos don't have covering tattoos, your body. Yeah. You, you know, I mean, Tupac having stomach tattoos and everything was weird right. back then, and now it's, it's, the standard. it's the standard. I feel like you guys and Tupac sort of set a style blueprint that today everybody essentially follows. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. Like, so back then, we knew how important it was to not, not follow anything that was, that was, that was already there. To set the standard and set the bar, like we was the first R&B group. Black guys really have tattoos unless you was in a biker gang. Right, you know? that's true. You, you were <laughs> so. the first. Yeah, let's just say that again. You were the first R&B group with tattoos. Tattoos, and the first real black guys covered in tattoos unless you was in a biker gang. You know, so it's like, and you know, we had two earrings. It's like, well, are they gonna think you guys are gay or this and that? You know, back then that was just it wasn't it wasn't heard of. Right. And then it was like if you don't have that 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 mold or that. You know, the blueprint right, or, or that then, uniform yeah, is dude, like, yeah. Because, yeah, you know, you look at the other R&B groups at the time, they had suits on. Suits on. They had their, you know what I'm saying? They were, yeah. they were smooth. Right. They had the S-curl. Right. It was it was very polished. Right. You know, because if you go even farther back to the Smokey Robinson, the Marvin Gaye, that was like suits, suits. Yeah. and yeah. bow ties and everything. Mm -hmm. You guys went completely the other direction. And I think that, uh, I think that it made a statement and it made people definitely... You know, look, before they heard the music, they saw it, and they're like, oh, wait a minute. Then the songs, and they go with the look. You know, but like I say, sometimes when you go so far left, you, people, they'll get it. It's like it's like a white kid, from, you know, from from uh, Calabasas loving gangster music. Right. You know, so it's like, you know, they like, I mean, it ties, the two ties some kind of way. It's just weird like that. And you were like the rapper in the group. I just rap. I wasn't a rapper. I just, well, but I'm I, saying, but yeah, you were, I, I, when, when there was a rap in Jodeci, yeah, yeah, I did it. Mr. Dalvin was usually the person doing right. it. Well, because I mean, I brought the edge to the group as far as like you know, yeah. for our style and our, our energy and the hip hop side. Because I was always a hip hop head. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. verse even with the music, I listen to I listen to all the rappers: Rock Him, you know, LL, Public Enemy, Big Daddy Kane, you know, so forth and so on. Yeah. So I was I always had that in me, like as, as a kid. Then I would flip to the music. Right. Definitely an honor to finally hey, finally do this, hey, man. man. Hell of a story, and I can't wait for the biopic. I heard it's still in the uh, in the writing stages yeah. right now, yeah, it's but it's, it's gonna happen. Yeah, you know. And then we, we speed up, then we slow down. We speed up, then we slow down. But yeah, it's good. I can't wait for it, man. With such an incredible body of music, man. You taught me a couple of things I didn't know today about Puffy and the 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 be logist. <laughs> yeah, man. You know, this is what I do. I do, you know, you do music for a living. I, I talk to people Absolutely. for a living. That's what it is, Davin. Hey.